If you need to know how to create some quick renders of a boxed product in After Effects, but aren't quite sure how to do it, stay tuned and I'll show you how to get up and running. Hey there YouTube, this is Ben from BEMotion.design and on this channel I discuss all things production and post-production. From actual day-to-day -day usage and content creation to tech tips and reviews of hardware, gear, and software. So if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing and at any point take a gander at the show notes in description below for links to things discussed in this video. So let's dive right in. In a previous tutorial, I showed you how to use the set selection tag in Cinema 4D to texture a box when creating renders of box art for a product. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to do the same thing, but in After Effects. I do want to preface that I'll be using third party plugins. I'll primarily be using Video Copilot's Element 3D to do the main texturing, but to further stylize the composite, I'll be using Video Copilot's Optical Flares as well as Boris Effects Sapphire plugins. I recently had a client project where I had to do this exact process. It was a little more complicated than what I'll be showing here, but the principles are, are the same and they apply. Basically, I had to replace the box art of a product that was already baked into the footage and it had already been shot and we couldn't reshoot it. Thankfully, the shot was locked off and there was no tracking involved, but I did have to match the movement and lighting of the original shot to composite in the digital replacement. So we'll be using the same box art from the previous tutorial. And instead of live footage, I'll be using this 3D render that I created in Cinema 4D. While I have this previous example that I created for the preparation of this tutorial, let's, let's go ahead and start from scratch. We'll take the background image and drag it over the create new composition icon and hit command or control K to open the composition settings. And we'll rename the composition to, hmm, let's say hipster underscore brew underscore Keurig underscore box art. Uh, and we'll make this version two. Okay, next we'll add element 3D, but to do this, we'll first need to create a new solid by hitting command or control Y, and we'll rename the solid to E3D and hit okay. You can add element 3D a few different ways, but what's become the quickest and easiest way for me to add the plugins uh, is using Video Copilot's FX console. Uh, and if you don't have it and don't know what it is, you should go to Video Copilot's website and check it out. It's pretty cool. But if you don't have that installed, you can go to the effects and presets panel to add it from there. So the first thing that we need to do is to match the perspective of the background image. So when we add the box later, it will sit perfectly in the scene. And actually, before we do that, let's create a camera uh, for this After Effects scene. So after we add the camera, uh, let's hit the scene setup button in the effects panel. And once the element interface opens up, we'll uh, create a plane, which will be our floor. And we'll double click the model to rename it floor. And we can scale this up pretty big and we'll hit okay. When we come back to our scene in After Effects, we don't see anything and that's because the floor is flat and right in the center of the frame. So if we hit C to get our unified camera tool uh, and then rotate our camera in our scene, then we'll start to see the floor. We can adjust the camera angle so the plane can match the floor of our background uh, in our scene. And uh, let's go back into Element 3D and scale up the floor to about 200%. Okay, so now that we have the floor set, we can add a cube to the scene. And by default, the cube is cut off by the floor and we can manually raise up the cube so it sits on top of the floor. But the quickest way we can get it seated exactly onto the floor is to scroll down to the alignment section in the uh, transform, transform section of the model tools here. And we can switch it to, or we can switch it from model center to bottom. If you saw the previous tutorial, you would know that box art was created on a scale of two to one. So the artwork is twice as long in the width as it is in the height. To accommodate for this, we'll change the dimension of the cube to two in the X and one in the Y. And because it's squared, uh, the Y and the Z are squared, so we'll do one in the Z. Uh, I also want to reduce the size of the chamfer or bevel to 0.01. So now when we add the box art to the scene, it will be mapped correctly. Sadly, in Element 3D, there isn't a way to make a primitive object 
editable like there is in Cinema 4D. So the way that I found to get around this is to create a plane for each face of the box that needs its own texture. And in this case, we have a front and two sides. So let's rename this cube to base and then we'll add three planes to the scene. Before we add the planes, I want to hide the floor and the base box model by clicking these buttons right here. And when we add the plane to the scene, the default settings of the plane have it oriented uh, to the XZ plane. So we have to rotate it 90 degrees. You can either click the rotate tool at the bottom of the viewport or you can hit the key command. And if you're not sure what the key commands are, you can go up to file in the menu bar and scroll down to preferences and under transform shortcut you have a contextual menu uh, that gives you two options WER which is the default and ERT which is the second option and these letters refer to the default key commands for switching between move rotate and scale tools and uh, refer back to the key commands in 3d applications like cinema 4d and 3ds max uh, I think WER are the key commands in 3ds max but I use ERT because they are the key commands in Cinema 4D. And since I'm used to them, I changed the default key uh, command settings to reflect Cinema's behavior. <clears throat> so back to our plane. So one of the next things that we need to do is rotate at 90 degrees on the X axis, which is indicated by this red circle. But you also uh, can go into the transform section of the model and change the orientation of the X axis to 270 degrees. And uh, let's also change the alignment from uh, the alignment of the model from model center to front. And that will raise the plane to sit right on the floor, which is what we want. So let's go to size X, Y and enter a value of two in the X and we'll keep the Y value set to one. Also, while we're here, let's activate the two-sided plane option. So typically, uh, you won't see any change unless you rotate around in the viewport to see the backside of the plane. And since we've activated the button, we see the backside of the plane. Uh, when the button is deactivated, not engaged at all, uh, then we won't see the backside of the plane. And you might be asking, why isn't that activated by default? And I would say that my guess is it has to do with default system resources because when it's activated, there are more polygons and vertices in the viewport, and the more polygons and vertices that you have in your viewport, the more taxing it can be on your graphics card. So it's just a way to save on VRAM resources. So that now that we have the plane in our scene, let's move it to the front face of the box. And you can do this manually and eyeball uh, the placement by dragging the plane along the Z axis. But one way to get it to be exact is by using uh, some simple math. So since the sides of the box are one unit square and the axis of the box is exactly in the middle, you can divide one by two to get 0.5. So we can input a negative value of 0.5 into the Z axis and our plane will be exactly where we need it to be. So let's rename the plane to front and then right click on the plane and select duplicate all and double click to rename this plane to side one. Before we go any further, let's quickly rename all the materials so we know which is which. So double click the material and rename it to side one. And let's go to the front plane and double click the material and rename it to front and then double click the material for the box model and rename it base. And lastly, double click the material for the floor and rename it to floor. And you'll notice that in the scene materials panel, all of the names have been changed accordingly. Uh, okay, let's create some materials for the scene so it's not so boring and just white. Um, for the floor material, all we really need is the reflection and the shadow since this is going to be composited onto a background. So let's go to our floor material and scroll down to reflectivity and increase the intensity all the way to 100%. And you should be able to see that the floor is now reflecting the environment, but you're not seeing any reflection of the box in the floor. And that's because you have to select the floor plane and in the edit panel, you can scroll down to the reflect mode. Uh, you can also get to the reflect mode by clicking the reflect mode icon right here. 
and change the default mode to mirror surface and immediately you should see the box appear in the reflection on the floor. Uh, so one of the things that really contributes to the realism of a 3D render are the materials of your 3D objects. And even though this is going to be composited onto a background with a wooden floor, uh, real wood flooring would not have a clean, crisp reflection like this. So in version 2 of Element 3D, Video Copilot added a physically based shader and allows us to get more realistic shadows and reflections, but we can also add texture maps to help achieve another layer of realism. Uh, I get a lot of my textures from Polygon.com, and that's where I got my textures for this example. And what's really uh, great about a site like Polygon.com is that the textures are very high quality. And not only uh, do you get the diffuse texture, but you also get the gloss map and the specular map and the reflection map, as well as the normal and the bump maps. And in some cases, you also get a displacement, a displacement map, which is uh, not what we will be. We won't be using displacement at all for this. So I downloaded the floor texture and a paper texture. In this example, I won't be using all of the maps that come with it, but I know that they're here if I ever need them for something else. So the floor texture, all I want is the glossy map and the normal map. And what's great is that I can drag them into their respective slots. I can drag the gloss map into the glossiness texture slot and then the normal map into the normal texture slot. And you can see right away uh, the effect that these two textures are having on the floor reflection. And to add to the intensity of the effect that each texture has on the material, you can adjust this number here. By default, it's set to 100% but you can adjust it either above 100 or obviously below. Now, uh, let's do this for the base material as well. And for the base material, we won't be using a diffuse texture, but instead we'll change the diffuse color for this material. So let's change the diffuse color to a nice dark brown. And if you had an exact color from your client that needed to be represented, you could input the hexadecimal value here. Uh, but since this is an example, I'll just get a nice dark brown color. In this particular instance, I don't want full on white to be the color of the of the reflection. So you can change that color here and I'll get a very kind of light brown as my reflection color. And that will also bring back some of the saturation of the overall color of the box. So for this material, we'll do the same thing as the floor and we'll use the gloss and normal map of a real texture. So I have this paper texture uh, from the same website and I'll drop the gloss map into the glossiness texture slot and the normal into the normal texture slot. And I want the box to be a little more reflective. So I'll dial down the strength of the texture. And for this texture, I'll increase the strength of the bump. And by doing this, I can also see that I'm not crazy about the scale of the bump map. Uh, it's too big. Uh, so to reduce the scale of the bump, we can click on the texture channel and go into the detailed mapping of the texture. And in this case, we want to increase the UV repeat in the X and the Y. And as we do this, we can see the material updating in the viewport. And then we just adjust to taste. So I'm happy with this. So I'll hit OK. We can do the same thing for the front material as well as the side materials. But since the diffuse channel will be the only thing that will be changing with these materials, we can simply duplicate, duplicate this material, rename it, and apply it to the respective model that it represents. So let's right click the base material in the material panel and duplicate and immediately it creates a copy of that material. So let's rename it to front and then let's drag the front box art into the diffuse texture slot of the material and then drag the material onto the front plane. And we can barely see the texture and that's because we need to change the diffuse color of the material to white instead of brown. Uh, we also might want to change the color, of the, the color of the reflection to something closer to white and reduce the intensity of the reflection. Now we can do the same thing with this material. Uh, duplicate, rename, and apply. And once we've applied the material, we don't see it reflected on the side of the box. And that's because we didn't finish positioning the plane to where it needs to be. So let's do that now. We can rotate the plane 90 degrees on the Y axis 
And since the X axis of the box is two units long, if we divide that by two, uh, we know that we can move the plane one unit on the X axis to get it exactly where we need it to be. And then zero out the Z axis to get it exactly in the center. And since the sides are square, we can change the size in X back to the default one. And uh, now we need to change the diffuse texture in the texture slot. We'll drop the artwork into the diffuse texture slot and immediately we see it update accordingly. And now we'll duplicate side one and we'll select duplicate all and we'll rename the model and the texture to side two. Uh, and we need to rotate the plane 180 degrees on the Y axis. And to position the plane exactly where we want it to be, uh, we change the transform value of X to a negative value. And we find our side two texture and drop it into the diffuse texture slot. And now we have a texture on all the sides that we need. As a matter of maintenance, let's uh, get rid of the materials we aren't using. And we'll click this little triangle on the side of the material panel and select remove unused materials and uh, we'll exit out of element 3D. And now that we're back in After Effects, uh, I realize that I forgot to do one thing inside of element and that's to get rid of the floor and keep the shadows and the reflections. So let's hop back into element real quick. And if we go to the floor texture, we'll see the parameters appear in the edit window. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, we see two options that we need to enable, matte shadow and matte reflection. And if we enable those, we see right away that the floor disappears, but the shadow and the reflection remain. So let's click OK to exit out of element. And now we see the result that we were after. So those are the basics of adding textures to different sides of a box using Element 3D and After Effects. And since this tutorial has already gotten to be pretty long, let me go to the project I already created to show some additional finishing touches that I made. So I toned, I actually toned down the reflection of the box in the floor. And uh, if you go into the render settings of the plugin, twirl down ambient inclusion, and then enable it and change the default from SSAO to ray traced, you'll get more realistic contact shadows. And I also enabled shadows and I changed those to ray trace as well. Um, and then I added some lights with uh, shadows enabled as well uh, to make it sit in the scene and look a little bit more realistic. Uh, here's the lights on and here are the lights off. And I'll turn them back on. And beyond that, I added some video copilot optical flares. And I actually created three layers of this um, and one for the background and there's another layer that will be occluded if the box is moving. And then there's one uh, layer, uh, another layer on top that kind of gives kind of a little bit of an extra glow on top of it. So lastly, I added some color correction on top of that with an adjustment layer and starting with a curves adjustment to add some contrast. Um, I then added Red Giant's Misfire Vignette, which is my favorite vignette plugin. And on top of that, I added Sapphire's film damage and disabled all of the features except for the grain, which I also reduced slightly. And I use film damage uh, instead of the uh, Sapphire grain because for whatever reason, I just feel like the grain inside of film damage is so much more realistic than the actual grain plugin. Uh, but you could use that as well too. Uh, and lastly, I added Sapphire's warp chroma uh, to give the entire image a hint of chromatic distortion so it doesn't look quite 3d or digital uh, and when i say a hint i do mean a hint the value that i have set here is really really low so that's it for now and if you found this quick tip helpful please give the video a thumbs up or a like and if you have any questions leave me a comment below and please hit the subscribe button as well as that little bell icon next to it so you can be notified when new content is posted on this channel uh, you can also find and follow me on twitter facebook and instagram uh, i post pretty regularly on those social channels so to get your own copy of Element 3D or any of the other plugins discussed in this tutorial, click the links in the description below. Thanks again. Bye-bye for now.